favorite track soul rebel natty rebel what a legacy what a man wherever you are in the world we ask that you give a moment of silence in respect for the originator you want beckford daddy you roy may his soul rest in peace and may he continue to wake the town and tell the people right now we're waking the town and we're telling the people that kingston jamaica kingston city has been a creative city of music since 2015. the unesco creative cities network was created in 2004 to promote cooperation with and among cities that have identified creativity as a strategic factor for sustainable urban development. There are 246 cities which currently make up this network and they work together towards a common objective, placing creativity and cultural industries at the heart of their, local, of their development plans at the local level and cooperating actively at the international level. Um, greetings, Reggae family. Welcome to another staging of Reggae Open University. I'm your host this evening. My name is Colleen Douglas. And I just want to take the opportunity to thank some wonderful people who made Reggae Mon possible. The producers of Reggae Mon, the Ministry of Culture, Gender, Entertainment and Sport, and Jaria's biggest sponsor, the Ministry of Tourism, the Chase Fund, Sajikor, Starlight Productions, JTB, TEF, CPTC, Java, JCDC, Reggaeville, Rhythm Agency, Surfer Reggae, Reggae Festival Guide, M1 Production, and SR Rehearsal Studios. I'm pleased to have three wonderful people as my panelists today. On set with me is a sister, in, good, good sister, in too. <laughs> her name is Dania Beckford, and I dare her to behave herself. Today. I will, I will behave. She is a brand communicator who has expert in media and communications for 15 years. It's a little bit over, but you know it is when we want to remain young. She's the Director of Entertainment of the, at the Ministry of Culture, Gender, Entertainment and Sport and also Founder and CEO of DMB Communications. She holds a Master's Degree in Integrated Marketing Communication and a First Degree in Media and Communication specializing in Public Relations with a minor in Cultural Studies from that good place called Caramac at the University of the West Indies, Mona Campus. And on Zoom, we have our brother, Mark Roach from New Zealand. Mark has over 25 years experience in the music industry across a number of roles such as recording artists, indie record label owner, artist manager, licensing and copyright manager, music reviewer, broadcaster and creative director. He co-founded Independent Music New Zealand and founded and shared the Music Managers Forum New Zealand. He's also former chair of the Music and Audio Institute's Performance Advisory Committee. Welcome to Jamaica, Mark. I'll be virtually. We look forward when, when, when we open up. And we have David Wright. I should also say that Mark also owns and runs Muse Creative Agency, 
which specializes in artist management, graphic design, photography and writing for music industry clients, as well as artist management. Sounds like Mark and us could have a good experience. I know. David Wright, David Wright, David, I remember when I meet you, you know, but I know some I meet you somewhere, <laughs> is the local economic development officer at the Kingston and St. Andrew Municipal Corporation. He works alongside the CEO and the political directorate in crafting and implementing local economic development initiatives and communication strategies for the KCMC. Um, he left the Jamaica Observer in 2017 and began working at KCC and has worked on conceptualizing and implementing several corporate and government projects for the benefit of communities. And he wants me to let you know that he attends the Emmanuel Apostolic Church in Portmore and is a very proud Jamaica College old boy, Ibu, Ibuas Company. His interests include youth development, marketing and communication, local economic development and sustainable development. Welcome, David. Welcome, Mark. And thanks, Dania, for sharing physical space with me. No problem. I'll be being physically distanced. Yes. And I just want to share, I know we were just sharing a good vibe from you, and I want to share a good vibe from this part of Jamaica, some, a graduate of the Edna Manley College of the Visual and Performing Arts um, in a band called Pentatush doing a song in tribute to, to Kingston. And you know it goes in this world, so we kind of give them a vibe. We're going to go for a lovely little video. that song because outside of the fact that the rhythm is nice you know it kind of tells you what Kingston is for me Kingston has a kind of pulse with everything it gritty it dirty sometimes but, but it, have a vibe. It, it have a vibe yeah. and it's a vibe that you get nowhere else nowhere but here else. and I think it's because of that vibe that we get this special sound that we call reggae we get this special sound that we now call dance hall because of what Kingston is. And then I'm going to go to you just because you're there beside me. And that's a polite thing to do. Um, 
to on what premise was Kingston given the status of creative city of music? Well, you know, you said it in the introduction where you mentioned that one of the reasons why the, the UNESCO creative cities exist is because there needed to be a corporation among cities that has put creativity at the forefront of their sustainable urban development. Mm -hmm. And in saying that, we can think about our own city, Kingston. We think about the fact that we're so dynamic, as you were saying, we are nestled um, in basically a valley. We're surrounded by the Blue and Jonker Mountains, which is also a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Mm -hmm. And as you talk about our music, we have given the world six genres of music, and we see them all around on the set. So yes. we know mentor, ska, dub, rock, steady, <coughs> reggae, and dance hall. And uh, on top of that, our rich culture in terms of our, our dance academies, or theaters, the types of performances we have here, the the fact that our music has influenced the entire world and then when we talk about the fact that Jamaica and Kingston is the global mecca of the world a lot of people think we hype a whole people we feel like we show off we, we hype for true but that's what city branding is about you use what you have to sell your city and Colleen you and I know that most of the people who come to Jamaica, yes, they love the sun, the sea, and the sand, but you can get sun, sea, and sand on other islands. They come here for our culture. They come here for our music. And those are some of the premises that ensured that we got the status of Creative City of Music in 2015. We're going to touch city branding a little bit later on in, in this conversation. But as we speak of city, I want to go to um, Mark, where Auckland became a criti uh, Creative City of Music two years later in 2017. Um, do you want to share with us, Mark, your process for on becoming a creative city of music, um, similar to what Daniel would have described for us here in Kingston? Yeah, um, so we, I, we, we don't have quite the, um, the same distinct sound that uh, Kingston does, but we have a very rich musical heritage. Uh, so it, for us, it was how to encapsulate that. And, and when I saw... Um, our colleagues in Adelaide had, had, had applied to become a city of music and I sort of tracked their progress. Um, and that's when I first heard about the, the Creative Cities Network and it seemed to me that that would be a, a great vehicle for wrapping up all of our, um, all of our music strands that we have here uh, under one umbrella and finding a way to then um, harness that, that creative power that we have going forward so so it was driven <coughs> very much from um so i i work for a um recorded music new zealand which is a, a non-profit that represents the rights of um, artists and record labels and distributors um our colleagues uh, at the songwriting association joined us and we put the case to our council um we then worked with all the council staff to drive that through um get the buy-in from councillors and the mayor um, and to be fair, it was a bit of a no-brainer. Everyone saw the value in it. Um, and, yeah, we were designated at the end of 2017. Okay. You know, I'm curious, Mark, like, what your music sound like? Tell us a little <laughs> bit about um, New Zealand's music. Well, it, it's interesting. Um, what Danny said about uh, about how reggae and um, and other forms have, have uh, gone across the world because... Uh, Reggae here is is, is massive. <laughs> it's it's uh, and I think I I don't know if I'm speaking in a class here, but I'm pretty sure we gave Bob Marley his first number one outside of Jamaica. I'm not sure if that's a fact. I'm misremembering, but it's something like that. <laughs> um, so so yeah, we we are sort of like I guess a sort of sum of of influences. Mm -hmm. um, reggae, Anglo American music. Um, you know, we have mm -hmm. very close relationship with Australia who's like our big brother next door. Um, we're a British colony, so we get all that, you know, that British music was, was heavily influential in the 60s and 70s. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know if there is a distinct New Zealand sound. We have a very um, strong indigenous um, uh, Maori music scene as well. Uh, so that's, um, you know, non-English. It's, it's te reo Maori, um, sung in te reo Maori. So, uh, yeah. Uh, we, we have wrestled with this problem. When we talk about Auckland, um, we find that when we drill down, suburbs in Auckland have distinct sounds. 
So if you go out to the like South Auckland or West Auckland or North Auckland, there, there is these pockets of, of genres and sounds that have developed, but as a, as a whole, Auckland doesn't have that sound. So once again, it's like, for us, the challenge is how do we harness that? How do we, um, you know, encapsulate just the broad range of, of music that's coming out of this city? Thank you, Mark. Um, I will come back to you for you to tell me about some of your strategic plans in harnessing exactly that. Um, David, the, the, you, what you do, you do plans, the strategic and integral use of cultural resources in urban and community development, I know is very important to you. And UNESCO speaks a lot about the art of urban design, the art of winning community support, the art of even transportation planning and mastering the dynamics of community development. All this is involved in the arts for effective cultural planning. I'd love for you to share with us the role of, of KCC in this creative cities model now as you see. Hi, good evening everyone. As Dania rightfully said earlier, uh, cities are, you market your city by what you have. And um, at the municipality, we see our major role in selling that vision, um, in packaging as best as possible municipality, which is Kingston and St. Andrew, but predominantly um, Kingston, packaging that and selling it to not just the locals, the residents, but also to everyone that visits everywhere that we go um, in the hosting of our events for we we go about the you know the regulation and changing of regulation as it relates to our entertainment doing things that benefit the sector as a whole um that's on the legislative side but it, it's it's both marketing it but ensuring that the environment and that the legislative environment as well as the facilities um are at such a standard that the brand that people are marketed you now holds them and grips them when they come here to visit thank you um Danny, i want to throw back to you because i i know one of the the, the point, the best practices that UNESCO refers to is developing hubs of creativity and innovation and broadening opportunities for creators and professionals in the cultural sector. Mm -hmm. um, how, how do you think from your ministry in terms of your portfolio in the entertainment division, what have you done to, to achieve that particular objective? Well, you know, one of the things that we were focused on is not recreating much of what we have, but from the minister's point of view, facilitating it to advance. Because at the very heart of the Creative Cities model is using your music to ensure that you have economic advancement. Mm -hmm. So a lot of our music came out of inner city communities, especially we talked about the six genres. They were all creative, created in Kingston. It came out of some hurt, it came out of pain, but it also inspired hope. And in some of those communities, we have centers, schools, training facilities. We can even speak about Edna Manley College, where you know that it is, and you continue to boast, the first of its kind, only of its kind in the English-speaking Caribbean. But what we've done is that we have done a number of programs with the Edna Manley College. We have done a number of programs with the Institute of Jamaica because one of the things that we wanted to focus on back in 2015 when we got that status is to ensure that our music museum, which is Jamaica Music Museum, which is a part of the Institute of Jamaica, that we provide a larger home for it, that we provide marketing and media for it, so that people are able to know more about our culture. Another thing is that we ensure one very important part of the network and the model is that we create opportunities for the creators of music or those who perform music. So we have a lot of exchanges going on within the 246 cities. For us in Kingston, we have had exchanges with Katowice in Portland. We have had exchanges with Hamamatsu in Japan and also in Mannheim in Germany. And some of that has come through um, artists from the Edna Manley College. Others have come through specific requests from those cities. And oh, we've also had one with Bogota in Colombia. And I think you are a part of that one. So you can give your experience if you want to. But I'm at one of the things that we focus on is ensuring that we have these opportunities that are granted to persons within the industry. We try to as best as possible with the funding that we have to facilitate the organizations who are already propelling music as economic advancement. So we're not into recreating but ensuring that we facilitate and uphold what we already have. Um, you mentioned um, Bogota and I know I, I, I was 
with the artists who went to, to, to that particular city. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I noticed was how they, and David, that's perhaps something you can answer. In the daytime when we had some time, we walked down the streets and it was a complete music street. Um, from people selling musical instrument, to artists painting, to people providing food, to a craft market, everything. They, there were no vehicle traffic in the afternoon on the street because it now becomes a, a street dedicated to music. Um, perf live performances on location and it was really great how they incorporated the visual arts with the performing arts in that space. Is there any such thing that you intend to do as a, as a municipality to, to allow for this creative expression and for the economy to grow from it, the music economy specifically? Uh, absolutely. Um, or strategic create um plan or strategic plan for the city of Kingston does include the pedestrianization of several streets. There is a specific area of downtown which we refer to as Culture Key. Uh, many persons would be familiar now with the murals that are being done um, by the municipality as well as by the Kingston Creative Group yes. um, led by Mrs. Andrea Debsa Chung and her team, Doris Gross, uh, the entire team doing some great work and we're working along with them. So we have if you notice, we have pedestrianized sections of Water Lane and Temple Lane in downtown Kingston. We, you know, resurfaced the entire um, asphalt there with bricks to add to the aesthetics thereof. We have also done murals on all sections of Water and Temple Lane, and we're extending it down to Mark Lane. And that entire area is going to be have the same brickwork, pedestrianized walkways, and it's our intention to start encouraging. Um, waivers and you know to make the environment more friendly for promoters to come downtown with live music, live events. Um, the creative group, um, the Kingston Creative Art Group, they have a monthly art walk that they do where they have live music. Sometimes they have performances. Sometimes it's an art show. Different creative elements come alive. I think it's the final Sunday of each month. But from the municipality's perspective, we're ensuring that we partner with and we push this vision forward as best as possible. You would be aware of the work being done up by Ward Theatre, which will also enrich and add to the value that the Kingston um, creative talents possess. We also have several other projects extending um, along the boardwalk on the waterfront, because when you think of a city and you hear a waterfront, you're expecting it to be alive and vibrant, and that's what we're trying to bring. Um, to the downtown, downtown waterfront. We had some projects that we had started just before COVID. There are some that are still going on, um, including those with the World Bank and JC. So there's, there's a lot in store that we're building out slowly. Uh, had it not been for COVID, we would have probably been much further along. But, you know, you do see small changes happening across Kingston, and it's all pointing in that direction. Um, thanks, David. Um, Dania, I have to ask you, because in... I know it sounds like we have a beautiful roadmap for the creative cities, and I just want to know how much have we really done to, to accomplish some of what David is referring to? Are we really driving economy through this designation? We are, and let me just say up front that the ministry collaborates with the mayor's office on everything that they are doing, and we assist in facilitating. For example, he spoke about the murals. Now, that project was like four years in coming, but now we realize that with the collaboration with the, the, the mayor's office, a lot of the music videos that were being shot during COVID time was actually on those lanes that, mm -hmm. um, that David mentioned um we have a lot of people going down there taking photos now we have i even seen fashion shoots happening down there so what it has done is also assisted with the conversion convergence of the creative genres so the music are coming with the dancing holy people are shoot them them videos down there with the fashion and all of that but another thing that is important to the process colleen is that sometimes persons may say oh we have the creative cities thing i will not really i do not with it but it's 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 a long-term project. Everything will not happen all at one time, but it is also for the creators of music and the performers of music to buy into it. And in this COVID time, 
we know that a lot of events, well, no events are being held. Everything is, is virtual nowadays. But what it has also done is created linkages with the other cities where we can all exchange best practices. And there has been forums from some of the other cities that they've invited us to. Some persons within our industries, for example, um, recording studio owners and operators and even some artists have participated virtually in some of those sessions so a lot of times when we're not seeing everything happen at all at once we like to think that nothing is happening but it is indeed happening and over time we will see the economic growth from it thank you and perhaps what we can do is kind of wake up the town and say more say it loud and tell the people that this is happening right. i wanted to bring you in um, mark uh, to share with us a little bit about what you're doing to, to cultivate a vibrant music economy in Auckland and also if there are anything that you see us doing in Kingston, Jamaica that you would adapt as best practice. Yeah, I, I, it's interesting. I mean, I agree with, with Dania's point um, that this is a, it's, it's a long-term project and I think um, particularly when we first got our designation, there was an expectation that... Uh, I, I don't know if it's that that something would happen instantaneously. So um, part of part of what I do is, I guess, is managing those expectations and 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 trying to reassure people that although um, we have a strategy, um, uh, it's it takes a long time to to get those all the all the sort of ducks in a row to make to make the things happen. Um, so you know we have those aspirational things um, similar to to the the murals and the lanes, um, we're talking about heritage trails uh, linked. So linking the, particularly the inner city with um, song lyrics uh, and people explore all the music that, that's been created in the city over, over, the, over the decades. Um, but, you know, with, with everything we do, um, there are so many layers of bureaucracy to deal with. So um, our council has, has got, huge amounts of different um, organizations within it that have responsibilities uh, and, and it's marrying them all up. And I think, you know, although we've had, we started this project with, with a very clear idea about um, uh, growth in certain areas and, and, and beautiful aspirational projects that we wanted to get underway that would, would make citizens really proud of where they live and the music that, that, that comes from here. Um, I think the reality is more that we are working through um, policy and regulatory um, issues, uh, which is you know super unsexy, um, and and you can't really issue press releases about that. And it's all stuff that sort of happens in the background and happens quietly. Um, but we are making great progress on that. And I think from a from a city point of view. What's happened in the past with us is that the council has invested in music um, as part of their general arts and culture package, um, but they haven't done it in any meaningful way. Um, they've done it because they feel they need to, and they have done a great job, but it hasn't been driven from an artist's point of view and it hasn't been driven from a music industry point of view. So us now having this designation means our strategy really is that we can tie all these council organizations in together along with the music organizations have a common voice that says, this is how we, we progress forward. How do we make Auckland uh, a music, a proper music city that globally is recognized as, as a music city um, rather than piecemeal uh, projects happening here and there. Um, so having, having that cohesion, um, having us all around the same table is, is, a, is a major part of our strategy. Um, so yeah, not to, to drill down into individual things we've achieved um, because there there are a number of them particularly around education and um, gender equality but um, yeah I think I think uh, yeah as I say as a, a unsexy to say but our, our major achievement to, to date has has been the real breakthrough in, in driving policy uh, change within the bureaucracy of a, of a very large um, council organization mm -hmm. okay um while you were speaking, Mark, I was thinking, Dana, you probably have read it too, The Mastering of a Music City. That was a study done in Canada in 2016, which kind of outlines some of the things that they expect a music city to have. I'm not sure if you wanted to respond to anything Mark has said, but I wanted to just throw um, some of the things that came out of that report that 
there must be presence of artists and musicians and really? we have it <laughs> we should have a thriving music scene mm -hmm. access to spaces and places and i'm stopping there for a moment because it's a sore note in our industry yes. in terms of having access or to spaces or having spaces at all. Right. Um, let me respond to a few things that Mark had said in terms of things that our own city has done in terms of policy, because we know that we were having a lot to do with the Noise Abatement Act in last year and the year before, where we were in our ministry, which is Culture, Gender, Entertainment and Sport, were in uh, negotiations and collaborations and meetings with the mayor's office, as well as with the Ministry of National Security in driving policy to redraft what the noise abatement act looks like to the point where we want to change it from saying noise to sound because of course noise is a negative word and in terms of music and creating a city that is supported by music and driven by its creativity we wouldn't want to call music noise um, another thing is the, the 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 whole initiation of entertainment zones and we know that minister green she announced the first zone a couple of years ago in 2017 um, events are not quite happening now but these are some of the policies that come behind creating a city that we can all be proud of in terms of his music now getting back to your question where it regards to spaces for performances and just creating these types of hubs it is also on the table because we know that we live in a tropical climate and here in Jamaica we all get used to having events outside but that's one of the issues where or if or venues are also close to communities and we have to do the balancing at between persons who want to sleep and persons mm -hmm. who want to enjoy themselves. And whereas we know that our music scene wake up a whole industry where a whole lot of people get fed from it, mm -hmm. actually it's about 43,000 people that are benefiting in our country from our music scene that we have to make that balance. And so there has been a lot of private public um, collaborations in how we go about creating these spaces. If we're now going to get into more um, inside um venues even though we love the outside ones so more and creating little um, hubs like Colleen you live out by Bull Bay and you know that the music scene out there in terms of live music. Why, why the girl you come from national <laughs> platform yeah, to tell where yeah, I you live by so, the sea though so, you, you have so, the perfect jamaican so, lifestyle you know so, the so. truth is i live right next door to a sound man exactly but i knew that's what i was buying into right but i wanted to ask david one of the things that the mastering of a music city pointed out to in the report was that music music friendly and musician friendly policies mm -hmm. including whether it's business licensing to liquor licensing transportation planning and parking as well as the use of land are important environment factors and I just want to know and Dana you could jump in as well to share what is it that the KCAC is doing to ensure that some of these music friendly policies are really in place for for a thriving community and after after you respond David Dana you can just jump in and I'd love Mark for you to share with us any of your policies that you may may have to share with us from from new zealand as it relates to having music friendly policies under this creative cities umbrella david okay so uh dania had touched on some of it earlier in that we are working close with the ministry of culture gender entertainment and sports in having the noise abatement act um updated but separate and apart from the just calling it noise or um you know the, the the noise versus music or versus sound debate we have several other factors that, that the entertainment sector has reached out to the kcc about getting changes made or getting legislation passed for several things including the you know hours that they're permitted to have events a lot of these um the, the noise abatement act for example prohibits events from going past um, 2 a.m. on the weekends and in the weekdays, 12. And that's something that they want to see change because of the, the way that our music has evolved, you know, and it's just our culture that, you know, most of these events, what they tend to go from 2 a.m. to 4 to 6. So it's not necessarily just, um, it's a one-sided thing. We're also working closely with the creatives in, um, as well as Jampro in getting for the, you know, the shooting of music videos, um, stuff like that, getting um, waivers 
Um, a lot of times persons don't know and they think they go around it, but there are fees associated with doing shoots and stuff like that. And the Office of the Mayor has been working closely with, you know, JAMPRO and with the Minister of Culture, Gender, Entertainment and Sport to ensure that the fees associated with a lot of these different, you know, laws and agencies that we can get them as best as possible looked at, revised if necessary, um, to ease some of the burden in putting on um, the events that we see. A lot of these events have, you know, four or five permits before they can be staged. And we just want to ensure that we protect the investment that the promoters are making. We've also been working with a lot of different stakeholders in ensuring that their venues are um, up to code. And that's something that we do ensure that, you know, the clubs and, um, you know, the indoor venues particularly are of a certain standard that the safety of the persons who go there um, is not compromised. We work closely with Hope Gardens, for example, another big entertainment venue in our city, in you know ensuring that we can broker some sort of understanding or agreement between the residents of the Hope Pastors community and the um, the operators of the property, so that you know we don't have the creative industries disturbing persons' peace. But at the same time, we can facilitate these events being held, which you know employs so many persons and you know um, contribute so significantly to our economy. Um, Policy-wise, we are looking at broader policy for the near future. We're looking at the pedestrianization of streets. Um, we're looking at facilitating, you know, um, grants each year for, you know, the, the cultural um, aspects and the creative aspects um, of the city economy. We've invested heavily in award theater, and once that is completed, um, the drama and theater industry will just come alive in Kingston and it's something that we're really looking forward to. But it's also a space that will give, you know, so much employment opportunities um, to creatives across Kingston, um, you know, in different areas, they will be learning about theater on a whole different level. And, you know, that's something that we wanted to plug back into Kingston because Kingston was so rich in theater and it was such so much intertwined into the culture of the city. And we, you know, we allowed it to fade, but, you know, the, the days of Oliver and Miss Lou and drama and plays are coming back to Kingston and we're going to be pushing heavily on that to ensure that you know, the policies are there to protect it moving forward but so that it never returns to the state that it's in now, but also so that the creatives who are in the city with the, the talents in screenplay writing, videography, whatever it is that the theatre will need, they will get an opportunity to take their talents to the next level. Boy, David, I, I have to say before you come in, Dania, that theatre and drama never left Kingston, really. We, we have been. I do think what we miss, I saw Hamlet at, at Little Theatre years ago when I was in high school. So those things we miss, we wanted to come back, but I don't think it went anywhere. Um, Dania, about the, so I about I think it just, changed venues. We changed venues. Yes. But yeah. Um, t share with us a little bit about how you're collaborating in terms of music-friendly policies. Well, for one, research has become the forefront of the entertainment division at the Ministry of Culture. And it has been important and it's something that the minister pushes because we realize that a lot of persons always comment on how informal the entertainment industry is. And in formalizing that, we need research. And so we have been working with the PIOJ. We have been working again, as I continue to say, as I speak with the mayor's office to ensure that we have the information that the creators and the creatives need. So, for instance, during the period of COVID where we're not actually having events in our city, well, any type of events and especially music events, and we know that that's crippling the city, but we're doing an audit of uh, um, venues all over Jamaica, not only Kingston. So by the end of this period, we're going to know how many we have, how many can hold, um, as in the capacity, the types of events that are are, are going to be good for these, if, for these types of venues. And then we're able to provide the creatives with that type of information so that when they try to get their permits as at the, the KCAC, they are, better, they are better or fair with the information that they need to hold these events. And not only that, we have our registry at the ministry. And a lot of persons initially, they were like, you know, we're not sure we want to be a part of the registry. Why you want us to be a part? Are you just trying to get our information? But it again goes into that 
um, focus that we're putting on research because we want to be able to know how many persons we have in the different industries that we have here in Jamaica, the creative industry, and how is it that we can better assist you. So I spoke about the exchanges before. I spoke about the collaborations. Colleen, one thing we know about the entertainment industry is that they're very vocal. And this is the way to get vocal. When we do have your information, when we know you're registered on the registry, you have access to us all the time to tell us what it is that you need, how you want us to collaborate, and how you want us to work for you. Um, well, I'm smiling because one of the challenges we had when, you know, with the COVID-19 pandemic, when we needed information from industry, one of the things a lot of individuals in the industry were not registered anywhere. Oh, no, no. Sign up with Jaria, by the way, you can by going to jariaentertainment.com or any of our social media platforms at IG or Facebook and even Twitter and the Entertainment Registry. Registry. Uh, registry, registry at mcges.jv.gm. Of course, you can do jariaentertainment at gmail.com. So, for those of you who are online watching us from wherever you are, please remember that you can send your questions and or comments in the chat. I know we have Regamon's TV all over the place. We're on PBCJ, there's JCDC, there is Minister Grange's Facebook page, there is the Jaria Facebook page, there is Regaville Facebook, and there is Regaville YouTube that you can send your questions and we're monitoring questions or any kind of concerns any suggestions you may have for us here at, at, on this conversation about Kingston, Creative City of Music. I want to go to our guests from New Zealand. Um, as you share with us some of the music-friendly policies, um, Mark, that you, you would have implemented or at least considering to implement as you move into, this would be now your second phase, it's 2021, of your Music yeah. City status. Yeah, I, I would have liked to have um, um, said here's, here's some examples we've already done, but unfortunately COVID sort of curtailed our ability to, to roll out things that would have been rolled out last year. Um, but, you know, I will say there's a few things. So in terms of music friendliness, um, one of the things we're trying to pilot we'll be doing this year is uh, music loading zones uh, outside or near, near music venues. Um, so most musicians have told me that if that's the only thing we ever get achieved under this under this um, city of music project, that would that that would be an amazing thing because everyone's been ticketed or towed while loading gear into into venues. You know, just going about their their jobs and 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 their their craft, and they're getting um, they're getting financially burdened. So um, having having musician loading zones is a, is will be a major win, particularly in our in our um, entertainment districts. Um, we are also trying to speed up the consent process. So at the moment, if a licensed venue uh, wants to um, put on an all ages show, they have to apply for special consent or licensing um, to make that happen. And that process is taking anything between eight to 12 weeks, which is just untenable if you're, if you're trying to plan shows. So um, the short version of it is that, is that venues and promoters just aren't bothering. Um, they just give up. So um, again, we're at this table with the council, we can talk their language and they can talk ours. And uh, that's allowed us now to, to put in a mechanism that, um, and again, we'll be unveiling it later in the year, but a mechanism that, that will allow uh, venues to more rapidly adapt their, um, their venues for, for between all ages and, and R18. Um, we're also focusing on all ages shows as well uh, uh, in the community, so not just at the, the dedicated music venues, but in community halls and um, finding better ways that um, underage promoters uh, and underage bands can um, put on shows uh, and, and that sort of feeds into developing the next generation. Um, and part of that is the council has been undertaking an audit of all their venues and finding out exactly when and where they're being used, because uh, we're quite often finding that uh, particularly community halls may be being booked for, I don't know, a card playing club one day a week or you know, a couple of hours a week, and outside of that, it's not being used. So uh, we are trying to identify those venues that are better suited and making them more available for um, for shows and also providing grants that and capability for those 
shows. So uh, we have an entertainment unit called Auckland Live. Um, they mainly deal in large scale shows, but they're going to make their team available uh, and um, put together remote kits. So those things like hiring PAs uh, and lighting gear, that will be available to those, um, those applicants um, at no cost. And then there'll also be a financial grant available to them for other costs like security and things like that. Um, and also, yeah, just to go back to Daniel's point as well, that data, data, data is, is really the, the three key things. Um, data drives everything. So um, we are now evaluating, or we have been evaluating the, the sector, trying to find out exactly how much it contributes economically um, and where, identify where we can grow that. Um, and also mapping um, all the music in the city. So that's you know, where all the rehearsal studios are, where the recording studios are, where all the venues are, where all the community halls and, and, and theatres are that we can use for music use um, and providing a comprehensive um, overlay across the entire city that's accessible by all musicians so that they, they can easily find where they can play uh, and, and how they can access funding uh, for that um, quite rapidly. Thank you, Mark. Um, you know, we, we, we brag about Kingston a lot. Um, and it, it, it's a hit factor to say that you're from Kingston, even for those of us who are from beyond Moko. Um, we say that I'm from Kingston. Um, no, I say I'm from Kingston. Mm -hmm. um, so place branding is, has grown in, in the marketing world, Dania, yes. um, with branding techniques applied to the development of cities and countries. Um, I'm, I'm remembering class. Yes. <laughs> the marketing of a place is usually inherently anchored in its people, its history and culture, and is usually a clear strategy for projecting images and managing perceptions. Right. Um, we can't deny, I mean, we get it anyway, but we can't deny some of the perceptions that people have of Kingston, one of them being crime-ridden, very violent, very aggressive space. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we can deny that or run away from it. But how do we manage per perceptions of this music city to get people to come so that we impact our tourism product? Well, you know, you know I love city branding a lot. And uh, in branding a city, you really need to incorporate all the elements of the city. So you mentioned before that it was gritty, sometimes it does smell good, we have crime, but a lot of the studies also show that it is out of these types of situations seeking hope that the music emerged. And even studies from our Jamaica Constabulary Force has showed that in order to get into some of those inner city spaces and make an impact, music is what they have used for the people to relate to them, for them to have peace in other community because how much time um, things are happening in a community, gunshot, bus and all of these things and what them use. Music and artists, creativity to ensure that these things are quelled in these places. So we can't escape the fact that our city does have some of those things. But then our city also has a cool factor. When you go anywhere in the world and you say, I'm from Kingston, the first thing them actually mention is either Bob Marley, some other reggae song, some people try to dance. And so we didn't need a, a lot to brand our city. We don't have a lot of work to do internationally mm -hmm. because we're already known for it and this is one of the things that we have to big up JTB and we have to big up the Ministry of Tourism as a matter of fact when we got the designation in 2015 the entertainment portfolio was with the Ministry of Tourism and it was an easy twin because as we said before a lot of people come here yes for the sun sun and sea but they come here for the culture them come here for the music backpackers stay here for two weeks in a row especially in February because this is one of our big festivals reggae month is a big festival you know it's one one month of doing things and the research from customs and immigration have shown that in February we have a lot of visitors coming all over the world so that they can one go to the Dennis Brown and Bob Marley concerts they can go to the reggae Wednesdays they can experience an entire month of music of which they love and so we find that it doesn't take a lot for our city to take advantage of what we already have naturally and I have to big up, you hear a share big up JTB and the ministry, big up on herself, my <laughs> artist friend them and musicians, where, you know, when you talk to the third world people, they tell you, say, me never really get nothing from nobody. Me did carry one suit of clothes and me go to England and me go make a name. 
Um, so, so the well, of course, is, without them, we wouldn't have the music. We, without them, we wouldn't have the music. So big <laughs> up on herself. Yes. <laughs> big up on herself for continuing to produce. Um, I just, while you were speaking, I was thinking a lot about the the, the reggae month, reggae month in particular, and it's important that we're right now at this juncture. It mm -hmm. might be different this year. Some of the people who I'm accustomed to seeing, like Ellen from Rhythm, Big Up Yourself, I'm accustomed to seeing her perhaps from about 2010, yeah. coming here consistently. And in the early days of the reggae month, I remember we had, we had exchanges mm -hmm. without a music city. We yes. would have, I remember going to so Reggae Sonska because Reggae Sonska people came here. Right. Um, they, they brought bands, they played on our, our stage. So that exchange was going on informally before 2015. Right. Um, so, and so, even so, when we had our subcommittee meeting here with members from the Creative Cities Network, it was in February because we wanted to show off our big festival called Reggae Month. And if I'm to be very honest, whenever the exchanges are happening with our Creative Cities, Sister Cities, they, they, won't, come they won't come um, because I they want to experience Mark, Kingston. <laughs> we're coming to New Zealand. <laughs> you can eventually come here, you know, but we are coming to New Zealand. Just saying. <laughs> I, I, I absolutely loved going to Colombia and... Um, Minister, you're listening to me. When COVID <laughs> stopped, I want to go to some other places. So, Mark, I want to come to you in 2022. Yeah. I'm coming to I, New I, Zealand. I, I, I think I told Daniel that I don't, I'm not sure how, uh, it's, it's probably not a popular fact, but um, by, a, by a crazy coincidence, our national, uh, not our independence day, but our, our national day that we celebrate is the same day as, as Bob's birthday. Mm -hmm. So it, it tends well, to be a double cool. celebration here. Yeah. So tell me, Mark, I'm curious, do you have any plans to collaborate with Jamaica? Is there anything that you would love to do with us here? Uh, absolutely. Uh, Daniel and I have talked about this in the past, and we really need COVID to uh, just go away. Yes, <laughs> to, to go about into <laughs> business. Um, yeah, I mean, as Daniel mentioned, with, with collaborations with other cities, um, we haven't yet done a, a, a proper collaboration with Kingston, and I would love to. And just by the sheer fact of the, the huge amount of, of um, reggae artists we have in, in New Zealand and in Auckland, um, it would make sense for us to do songwriting um, collaborations and performance collaborations as much as we can. So we have a huge number of sort of festivals and performances happen um, in our summer. I remember which, David. As far as you. Um, <laughs> yeah, and it's just a matter of, of getting those artists together and, and, and making magic happen. Ah, we look forward. I look forward to hearing a little bit more about that project. There's yes. a there's a wonderful college here. It's an arts college. It's called <laughs> the Edna Mandy College of the Visual and Performing Arts. We we there's a music school there, so you may consider that in the mix. Can I just say that I just earned myself some plugs? Yeah. Yes. You just so, did. I, I just did. <laughs> yes, you but just David, did. David, <laughs> I wanted to go back to, to, to KCC and the, the idea of city branding. And when we speak about the murals downtown and what it has done to lift this space. By the way, another bad thing for a minute, the murals just start happening downtown. You remember Paint Jamaica? Of course. A long time it happened. Let's just say that. Yes. Now it's just whole murals streets. Murals are gone. Are gone whole streets now. Kingston Creatives, big up yourself. You've made that really nice and formal. But sometimes we must remember. We give thanks for those who started this trend. We do. So that we could see the light, you know. Um, so I wanted to talk to you, David, a little bit about KCC and your plans. Because some people have said the buildings them kind of derelict and now they come in it, they might go pop down anyway. So you yeah, paint up some old building for what? Um, when people come to the airport, what are you doing to beautify the space, to make the space look like we're branding it as a music city? If so, anything. Um on the issue of the derelict buildings. Um, <laughs> you really have to answer that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have to go there first. Um, most of the buildings along that area, which is something that um, not a lot of persons may have realized, is that since the work of the KCC and our partners in revitalizing downtown and marketing Kingston and remarketing, especially that downtown waterfront to the culture key to the creative art walk area, what a lot of persons may not have realized is that a lot of investment and a lot of businesses are moving back downtown. So we see a lot of those derelict buildings and previously um, unoccupied buildings, a lot of them have been sold and are being sold. 
So we we are painting a lot of buildings that you know may not be in their best condition, but I guarantee you that in a few years' time, um, or maybe even before the end of this year, most of those buildings will have been sold and some of them are already being upgraded and remodeled. You see Burger King change locations just recently. Um, you know, a lot of restaurants have come downtown, you know, there's Wendy's downtown. Now in that same block that we're building out for the Culture Key, um, stretching all the way up to Parade. So, you know, we're, we're branding the city. A lot of times we send out promotions. We stop using just the KSAC logo and we're pushing a lot of the city of Kingston or Kingston City. Uh, we're working with um, some of our private sector partners. Um, there's a beautiful sign in Montego Bay that we're um, working to have something like that of our own in Kingston, not with <laughs> the popularity that that sign came with. But we're working on a, um, I love my Kingston sign. And if you follow the mayor on any of his platforms, you'll see him throw out ideas like that. Uh, as it relates to the airport, we, um, for Reggae Month, I think two years ago, we had done feather banners and strung them on the light posts coming in from um, the airport. We are planning on doing something um, similar to that in a more permanent way that you know shows you know creative city of music, you know city of this city of culture. Uh, we recently also launched our website, relaunched the KCMC's website, which has an entire section dedicated to what you can do in Kingston, you know, restaurants that you can visit, events that would be held in that period. You know, you can now apply for permits on that website also. So we remodeled and refashioned the KCAC's website in, in, in order to ensure that it facilitates and it also supports, um, you know, the creative elements and music and culture and events, the nightlife, the night economy of the city, which is really you know, just as impactful on the economy as the, the, the day economy. So we've been working on that. We've remodeled a lot of parks and throwing murals um, in them. And um, as Colleen rightfully said, you know, even with the painting of murals now, you know, this, this started long ago. And I'd like to just shout out to some of our partners who keep doing, you know, what we say and keep asking us, you know, I remember when the food, the food and drink festival was being held. So they came to us and they said, you know, where can we get that, you know, has this feeling of, you know, culture and art and music. And we, we directed them to Fleet Street. And a lot of persons don't know that that's where the launch of the Jamaica Food and Drink Festival was held for last year. For last year. And, you know, it, it, it brought the space alive. I think it was here before last or last year. And, you know, they went in and, you know, all derelict building looking types of thing. But trust me, the, when they beautified it with their lights and the, the, the lights on top of the mirrors that are already there, it just brought the entire space to life. And many more persons have been asking the community, you know, how they can benefit from and tap into that type of um, space to have events there. Because, you know, it wasn't thought of before then of you know, renting it out. And that's another economic opportunity for that community. It's now a venue where launches and stuff like that can be held. So we're doing, you know, stuff like this empowering communities so that they can benefit. We're also doing stuff on the legislative level with the, the boardwalk that's being done um, by JSF. We're also putting in entertainment areas that will be there along the waterfront. So once that's completed, uh, you know, another space will be opened up there. We're working closely with the Ministry of Culture in um, looking at um, other zones of entertainment that can be established. Uh, definitely, you know, Kingston having just one, um, there are so many other spaces in Kingston that we can, you know, have such events and we're looking at also having mixed zones. So we're working um, on with the Ministry of Culture um, on that end. Yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, when you talk about entertainment zone, like me miss Raytown, let me just throw that out there. Me miss me Sunday night, them run a Raytown where people then dress up like them and go a wedding, some dress up like them and go a market, but it was just yeah. a fabulous purpose of just people right. having a a vibe um so 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 we we hope that we can get that going and get that going soon but one of the things i thought about while he was speaking then is mm -hmm. i don't know have you been to barbados during cup over yes when you and all the roundabouts are decorated yes why we can't do something like that for reggae month if we're and 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 celebrate the the genres of the music and we having the communities can, engage we can, that we way. We can collaborate with Jerry. We can to collaborate do that. with Jerry. Yes. Since as Semi go <laughs> Satan, this is a platform. <laughs> it's going to be done. MC <laughs> and what your name? Ministry. Ministry of Culture, then the Entertainment and Sport. 
Kingston Creative. If you're not listening, don't bother take it and own it. Member said Colleen did say it, and Jaria <laughs> needs to be involved. The Jamaica Reggae Industry Association. But but you know what, Colleen? We talk about entertainment zones, but that policy document um, that the ministry have about zones is not only zones. You have districts and you have venues. So as you talk about Raytown, that is on the table. Um, we, wiki wacky. Like, can I just throw in wiki wacky too? <laughs> <laughs> there are a number, but the point is there are a number of venues, there are a number of districts that are also on the table. Clearly, I wouldn't want to mention some of them right now because we're still talking to the municipalities about them. But I think that the creative city model here in Kingston is doing exactly what it should do because now we have more buying than when we just announced that the city was a creative city. A lot of people thought that everything would happen one time, but I think now the creators and the performers the persons who own venues, the even some of us who work in government has now seen the importance of having the status and it is working towards what we all want, which is economic development through creativity. So you've seen it. Um, KCC has seen it. Um, government generally see is the music community sensitized enough about the creative cities model? There is more work to be done. Um, I believe that one of the things that we have not done enough is wait the town and tell the people, as you said in the beginning. And I think that it was also because we were building out strategically what we would be doing over the course of the program. No. I, I can say definitively from the ministry point of view that that is what we're working on now, ensuring that some of these discussions that we're having now is not at the high level where you think strategy and government, but is more with the actual music industry community, which is what you and I are doing now, which is getting Jerry more involved, which is getting our entertainment advisory board more um, integrated in the in in what the industry wants from the status and really just revamping how we do things so going forward this is something that we spoke to spoke with the the KCC about is ramping up and collaborating with our private sector partners as well to get the communication and the marketing of our city more out there without of course not leaving out the Ministry of Tourism and uh, JTB and um, some kind of encouragement for for bands getting into spaces mm -hmm. um just the basic you know sometimes you hear the musician saying i'd put on a show but many little backline support mm -hmm. um if if a musician or if a set of musicians want to do a show like mm -hmm. that um the ministry offers some kind of support and what's that process for, for people who are doing events? Okay, so we have heavily invested in sponsorship for events and for initiatives relating to music. Not only music at the ministry, but because we're having a music conversation right now. Right now, as you know, there are no events happening. But if you remember when I spoke about the audit that we're doing of venues, one of the things we're taking into consideration is exactly what you just said. So if an event is going to be held here, if it is live music, which is what we want to happen, on. What are some of the things that you would need to facilitate this? Because we know that our musicians and our creators of music, they can't do everything in terms of putting on an event. And so that is some of the support that we're doing research on to ensure that we have the funding and the support of, again, our, our, our public and private partners to be able to deliver. So you're right on the money when you talk about those types of things. It's already on the board. I'm right on the money. She's right, right on the money. Right. Let's stay on the money. <laughs> no, you know, it's funny because I'm thinking of the mastering of a city. I thought that was a really strong report, by the way. And what mm -hmm. I loved about it was they strung the report together by using very music, not just music, but almost like a musician and engineer's kind of language. So we're at laying the tracks. Right. The first thing you are doing at the studio, yeah, lay the tracks, we're still a lay the tracks. Yes, we're still laying um, the tracks. So we're not reach mixing and mastering. We're not reach this yet. Not for some of the programs Not at for all. some of the programs. Um, I, I wanted to, to bring, Mark, Mark is fully awake. I keep thinking that he's, you're like what, 18 hours? Yeah, but so Mark, he's already into Friday. How is yeah. Friday, Mark? Yeah, I come to you from the future. <laughs> Mark, you know, as we talk a lot, we're, we're speaking more about Kingston. But we specifically invited you because of the, the notion of collaborating and best practice. And I know you haven't said much, but how much do you know, for instance, when you go to, and I'm asking you to publicly critique us now, when you go to our website that speaks about Kingston, Creative City of Music, do you think there is enough there? Is there anything that you would want to teach us to do better 
um, are you readily are you able to readily identify studios you could possibly work with institutions that you want to work with is there anything missing that you'd want to see oh um no but i think it, it's um i mean i'm just going to echo really what danny is saying it, it, it's always a work in progress with these things and and um we're in a similar position where it's um you know, we think we think we know what what needs to happen, um, but then you have to keep refining the process all the time. So, um, yeah, sorry, I'm not really answering your question here very well, but it's, um, it's okay. uh, it just strikes me that that we we are all in pretty much the same position of of kind of feeling our way through this process a, a little bit blind sometimes, um, working out what it is we need and we get to the we finally get to these stages so i think yeah we to use the analogy we're still laying down tracks at the moment and we're trying a few alternative versions of those tracks <laughs> that's that's where we're at so we're not even at mixing stage at the moment um but it's encouraging to see you know the, the growth and and the point we've got to with all of that um yeah sorry that's right <laughs> a little off the topic there so to be honest <laughs> Um, so I, I wanted to speak, Dania, and Mark could answer as well if you've done your, the first report that we did, um, referring to the, 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 where we said that Jamaica committed to the use, the creativity of its people, specifically in music, as a driver for sustainable urban development. And I know that David will get excited. <laughs> in particular, the city is focused on using music and the arts to redevelop and revitalize Kingston's inner city communities. We know we call it downtown. This will be achieved through conversion of derelict buildings for use as creative incubators and performance venues to promote appreciation for creativity and provide outlets for creative expression. Um, that's taken from UNESCO first report, um, 2015. And I just wanted to ask you, David, in terms of your strategic direction where are you with that you mentioned that you have some investors you mentioned the fact that you you partner and support some of these the mural the mural project downtown and i'm thinking but if they must sell the building them and they're going to mash them down we're going to paint again um, well well <laughs> i don't think they're mashing down the buildings at all some of the buildings that are being sold what i know from and david can um back me up on this answer is that there are certain rules in terms of you can't do this or that to the building because it's on a lane that they're creating with the creative oh, so it's actually protected right. is the um, um david i'd love for you to jump in because i do understand the principle of protected spaces yes um, I don't know how much of the spaces we have protected under our Heritage Act or so. But how, how do you manage that, that we keep some of what makes downtown Kingston special while we're developing? Yeah, so the use of um, the Heritage Act in protecting the space, that's one route that we have been um, taking. We're also working with the Kingston C Creative Group. Um, and Mrs. Demsa Chung, we're working with her on protecting not just just not just the um, the lane, the murals, but the entire art district, which extends down to now the Institute of Jamaica, um, you know, the National um, Library, National Archive, and goes up to Ward Theatre and the parade site. So we're working on not just protecting a building or not just protecting the lane, but we're also working on ensuring that these places and these spaces have the legislative protection that they need so that we're not back at this point you know five years or so down the line but dana is correct uh, we are protecting the spaces and that those buildings um, persons who are buying them are doing so under the understanding that you know the paintings or the muralization the murals are to remain as is um so okay so by the way not dropping a name in here unless it's a government name that's the only names we're asking you to drop <laughs> big up yourself andrea you know you are my friend but um i just can't help myself but ask mm -hmm. if if it is that we say we have the school of music mm -hmm. that has really been putting out um saying this without any kind of bias or attachment but without any question 
when you look on a stage, you see graduates of or current students of the Edna Manley College of the Visual and Performing Arts. Yet you will hear the young musicians say, we don't have enough piano in our piano room. We don't even have enough piano room. We don't have enough drum room. Everybody's a drummer, you know, a drummer extra. Mm -hmm. um, what have we considered in this Creative Cities model for an institution that is grooming, training and grooming young musicians? Well, educating uh, persons within the city about music and in the art forms of music is very important to the status. As a matter of fact, it was one of the things that was highly mentioned when we um, we made our bid to be a creative city of music. And you know that we've had a number of collaborations with the Edna Manley College. However, this is also where the public-private um, collaborations come in. So for instance, I know that the PSOJ, they are going to be investing in the use of music for some of their campaigns. As a matter of fact, the World Bank has also gotten quite a lot of features and commendations for the fact that they're using reggae music as part of their campaign to teach the nation about inflation. And so these are some of the collaborations that I'm telling you about that in the city, in the drivers of the city, realizing the importance of the music, we get to them, we get to the stage that they have realized it, and now we're moving to the stage where they're about to invest in it. Okay, and I, I, I really hope that the investment is not just in the intangible, mm -hmm. um, but also in the tangible, because I deliberately mentioned mm -hmm. some of the tangible mm -hmm. um, benefits that would be great to have, that there is actually adequate space so that we now have students who say, I want to study, but there is not enough space they can't take anymore. Right. Um, how we, we, we engage private partnership for that would be wonderful. Yes, and, so, and, 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 and the collaborations are good because remember that we're not in, the government is not in some of those spaces. So this is where um, the mixing after the laying of the tracks and we're about to get to the mixing part of it where we're able to talk about these things so that we are able to actually collaborate instead of you just going and by you right now I mean the Edna Manley College um, the Edna Manley <laughs> College going on its own to get these investments which is fine if you want to go that route but we're stronger together so as a ministry working with the college and any other training institute we have some at Boys Town we have some in Trench Town coming to the ministry collaborating with us like that we're a stronger voice in getting these collaborations to work. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, actually uh, go uh, down. Uh, is, uh, Colleen, sorry, just to add to as well. Go just, ahead. Not just the, not just the um, musicians that need training, but the, uh, the entire infrastructure. So that's something yeah. we've been um, working towards for the last four years and, and getting professional development happening amongst um, particularly recording studios, producers, um, uh, w with the music video makers, uh, the designers, the mm. artwork, um, so across the whole level and the promoters as well. So still looking at, at, at um, programs that mentor um, new entrants into the promotion market, because that can often be quite a closed shop mm -hmm. um, when you have established promoters who sort of have a stranglehold on a market. Um, and it's quite a daunting proposition for young promoters to get into. But um, so, yeah, it, it's sort of, um, sh sh sort of putting a, a, a light, a spotlight onto all areas of our, ecosystem um, because you know not every, everyone's a musician not everyone's talented enough to be a to be a, a number one star um, but we hope to encourage you know more people to be involved in, in you know all facets of it because that's you know the economic driver give thanks thanks mark for jumping in i'm looking at the guitar in your background i may have to ask you to play us a tune in a minute <laughs> dania you were edging on your seat you know yes, what I, you want to say <laughs> i was edging on my seat because i also wanted to mention the fiscal incentives program which is also good for the types of things that you are talking about it is definitely managed through the entertainment portfolio at the ministry and what happens with the fiscal incentives program which is uh, which also incorporates jampro is that uh, musicians persons who own studio persons who are in film and advertising you're able to purchase your equipment abroad when you ship them we won't be able to pay your shipping costs but if you're recommended and approved for the fiscal incentives you're able to get your items duty free and we know that in jamaica duty is one of the things that is always um of talk because you know me get jerry at a credit day because i mean no say to go on now but 
Big up on yourself, Charles Campbell and Ibo Cooper and all those <laughs> gentlemen, Steve Golden, who were pushing for this in 2009 to 2011. And we probably, you probably feel that they didn't get anywhere. They were listening. Thank yes, you, Dania, for because sharing. Because the fiscal incentives that came about in 2013, so it's out of those discussions with the persons that you have mentioned, which is proof that when you do advocate to the ministry and to your government officials, we do listen and we put things in place to ensure that it happens. One of the recommendations, and I, um, Mark can jump in if you have a music advisory board in, in, in Auckland, um, one of the recommendations for mastering of a music city was to have a music advisory board. Mm -hmm. I know we refer to an entertainment advisory board mm -hmm. to sort of make the industry a little bit more inclusive, but I'm wondering if there is a difference. Do you think there is actually a difference, music advisory? Um, I feel there is a big difference. Mm -hmm versus an entertainment advisory board? Well, for us, as you mentioned, uh, music is not the only thing that is entertainment in Jamaica. And we like to think of our work as converging. We don't want to have it too much in silos. And mm -hmm. so the minister has a board, the entertainment advisory board, and it has not only persons within music, but throughout the spectrum of our entertainment industry, mm -hmm. which we believe give a better snapshot of what the industry needs. But there are other boards. So we know that the JCDC, who unearths talent here in Jamaica, they have a board. Um, places like the CPTC, they have a board as well because you know media and technology is very important in this day and age when it comes to the distribution of our, our creative talent. So we use the Entertainment Advisory Board because it's more general and we think that we can get through to more of the industry. But what is also in place is also the Creative Cities um, um, subcommittee. And uh, whereas a new subcommittee is about to be named, we believe that doing it like that, we have that subcommittee that is focused on the music city status and what we do in the music industry. Minister Green, do you know I want to go on one board? <laughs> Let me feel, me, me reach that stage and now I want to go on a board. That was an aside. Um, so, <laughs> so I wanted to, 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 to speak to the music tourism, and I'd love for New Zealand to jump in on music tourism and how you're maximizing this. Boy, the COVID, let's pretend COVID now exists. So we are talk in relation to a no COVID-19 pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, I do know that the ministry collaborates a lot with like a TEF, but do we, have we collaborated for a, like a comprehensive music city strategy? And I'm saying that because I'm thinking, yes, we invite people to come to festivals, mm -hmm. but are there other things that we could perhaps think about that we would want to extend? So outside of festivals, for instance, as, and David, perhaps that's you, when we speak about musical landmarks, so we talk about down a big yard, who, where are your signposts, where are, the, the markers to say that these spaces exist, what are the plans for that? We know say Harry J up there, so we know they tracks them, the big tracks them from the catch a fire and so that were laid right there in that studio. Um, we know we're tough gong there, but we know it because we live here. Mm -hmm. Are we actively considering historical spaces? So I know you mentioned Jamaica Music Museum mm -hmm. and we mentioned the festival, but I'd really love to see if we're considering some of those as projects we can undertake to really full up this music city? Actually, yes. Remember, I told you that when we got the status, the entertainment division was with the Ministry of Tourism. So it was actually part of the larger strategy in how we get and market persons to come to the city because they did realize at the time and still do now, know mm. that music and culture was one of the reasons that persons were visiting Kingston specifically. So for the city in Montego Bay, most of the persons visited that city for the sun, sun and sea, but the ones who are coming to Kingston, it's because they wanted to experience this culture that we have. They never really wanted to be in, in um, five-star, all-inclusive hotels. They wanted to be out experiencing the culture. And as a matter of fact, one of the most visited um, tourism attractions in Kingston is the Bob Marley Museum. So persons actually come here so they can go what where Bob kinda, Marley were. Okay, was. so I'm going to pick on you, David, because they're kind of talking about like the studio them. I know people leave from far and wide because they want to come work with, um, they want to come work with Uroy. So Uroy would have had people in I'm Space recently doing things. 
we we have Uppsala Festival was at Harry J. Mm -hmm. But before that, we were having people coming in there to lay tracks. They come down to Grafton. So the studios. And I wanted to find out from you, David, what's in your plan under the Heritage Act as well? You know, England, so they have the blue plaques. <laughs> to put some of those kinds of plaques. And perhaps what I can think of is the... The Spanish Jamaica Foundation a couple of years ago, I think in about 2007 to 2009, they did it across the island trying to ensure that there was a Spanish presence in Jamaica because I know the English didn't wipe it out. <laughs> so in, in ensuring that there was a presence, they went across the island and put up a lot of markers in spaces where the Spanish ship would have had an impact. Yeah. Um, so David, I'm throwing that to you if you don't have it in. Uh, um, can, is that something you'd consider in terms of creating these spaces of spaces of important music heritage markers? Uh, definitely, it is something that we do have um, before us. We're looking at it. It's a part of our strategic development plan moving forward as a creative city of music. Um, we've already started marking some places, as I said much of the work that we've started to do has been done in our culture key. So the, some of the spaces in that area that have um, significance and historical value, we have started marking those areas. We have started doing work on monuments across the city. Uh, we've done a lot of work um, you know, on historical and cultural monuments, not to stray from the music, but just to add that we have started you know, marking um, places as we move further towards you know, the trench town and beyond. Um, across the city. Then we will start putting in, you know, plaques. There's a program that we're working with the Ministry of Culture on um, for a walk of fame um, type of thing for the city of Kingston, where we would pay homage to a lot of the persons who, you know, may never get their own museum. They may never um, be buried at National Heroes Park, which is running out of space. But we must ensure that there is a space where their legacy and their contribution to the rich music and the rich heritage that we have can be visited and that their stories can be told. And so we're working on that um, walk of fame space and concept. Uh, but yeah, we're definitely going to be, um, you know, marking and putting um, nameplates for want of a bit of term um, across a wider cross section of the city and for places with rich history and um, a, a rich heritage of, you know, birthing talents, um, not just community, but we're looking at also places like uh, the Alpha Boys Home, you know, so we're looking at spaces and places like these that have that history and that story that needs to be told and how we can move um, the city of Kingston from just, you know, uh, a backpacking through to a place, to a destination city, as the mayor would call it to ensure that, you know, when persons come here, they're coming for a full experience. Uh, by the way, there is nothing wrong with backpacking. Eh? I like my backpackers. We <laughs> want them to come. We want to come camp on the yeah. beach. We want to come and camp at the little... Because it's another type of tourism. And as, um, a, it is, it as is, a matter of is. fact, the backpackers yeah. stay for longer, which means them more money long. over time. So we want them they to do, come. So, so yeah, I've met a lot of interesting um, musicians who come at Jamnesia, for instance, to jam with a billy. And they stay in this space because it is actually a tourist mm -hmm. space. So, so it's to, to acknowledge, acknowledge that. So I'm happy that you're thinking about um, the, the, the markers at least and identifying the spaces for. But then I wanted to, to go, Mark, sometime I feel like I leave you to me just like your company mm -hmm. and me expect to say you go. So for Mark's sake. Um, can we get Jimmy Cliff's Reggae Nights? Why I'm asking for Reggae Nights? Because a lot of people don't realize that Reggae Wednesdays was not always Reggae Wednesdays, you know. It was Reggae Nights. When we started Reggae Month in, what, 2009, mm -hmm. 2010, thereabouts, Reggae Wednesdays was actually Reggae Nights. It, was, it was Reggae at Nights at time? Edna, right. around at the amphitheater. Yes. Well, lots that was of a things good vibe. Gone. Um, yeah, man. It was airy. Um, so, yeah. So, I, I thought of Cliff's reggae night so that we could just... Jam. Make we... Mark, you can get a chance to drink some water and we'll drink some too. The water is not sponsored, so we really don't want you to see the bottle where we are drink water. So, we are going to... No free advertising. We are going to... Um, anybody with water who wants to sponsor Reggae Month next year, please, um, <laughs> you may call the Ministry of Culture or you can reach us at Jaria. 
So let's enjoy this track, um, Reggae Nights um, by Jimmy Cliff. Bye. I can't even begin to tell you all how I miss outside, how I miss going to a show, closing my eyes and just jamming and getting whatever is coming out of that artist on stage on me because I'm usually right there. I completely miss that energy. You don't see how me are going? How me are going to the one um, little song? The one little song <laughs> where Dania is. I know we all miss that and so we are thankful for these kind of platforms. We are thankful that we had Regamon to remind us of this. For those, if you are just waking up and you haven't smelled the good Jamaican coffee yet, um, we are on our third Reggae Open University. We are looking at creative cities and what it does for our music. Um, I have Dania Beckford, I have Mark Roach. And I have David Wright from the Mark Roaches from New Zealand <laughs> spending some time with us. Um, he probably, perhaps he will play some music for us in a minute because he's an artist. Mark must be like, what's wrong with that girl? 
and we have been laying the tracks we've been talking a lot about for those of you who are on social please be mindful that you can send us your comments you can send us your questions on any of the Regamon TV platforms um, so at this stage I just kind of wanna let's go to our guest our guest from New Zealand Mark I know you said that you're you can't wait for collaborations um, what how I know how COVID-19 has impacted the world but what, what are you doing? How is your music industry faring now? And what are you well, doing? Yeah, I, I, I feel slightly embarrassed to, to, to tell you this, but we've, we've, been, um, we've been largely COVID free for the best part of Don't be embarrassed. <laughs> I think you should shout it to the world. And have been filling stadium gigs for the, for the last sort of six months. So um, yeah, we just recently had the One Love Festival down in Tauranga. Um, which is uh, 20, 30,000 people, something along those lines. Um, yeah, our, our bigger bands are, are doing stadium tours every weekend. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been pretty good to be honest. So um, yeah, we're, we're, not, we're not suffering too badly. The, the only thing we miss obviously is international touring um, and that's had a massive impact on our, uh, our music economy and our music ecosystem. So. Uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of production companies have gone under. Mm. Um, we, we've tried to, as a as an industry, we we raised a, around a million dollars um, during the the first um, lockdown pandemic area at the, at the start of twenty twenty. Um, so we 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 raised quite a lot of money there to to help music workers out. Um, but long term, that hasn't come through. So um, those those production companies rely on those those huge international tours coming to town um for you know for the the roadies the riggers the the, the stage crew and things like that um catering and stuff like that so um yeah they've really suffered um and obviously we don't get the benefit of of local musicians supporting those international acts either so so there is there is a, a severe dent in our economy um you know it, the, the, this the positive side of that is that there is more concentration now on local touring uh, and more interest in local artists that the, particularly the, the, the big network commercial radio stations that uh, don't have a, an expansive playlist, let's say, uh, are now focusing a lot more on local artists. So, so there is positives to take from it, for sure. Um, but yes, it would be nice if we got back to normal. Um, no, I'm actually quite encouraged that we could collaborate right now. We have a lot of COVID-free artists <laughs> who could come to New Zealand for some collaboration. As a matter of fact, we have been talking to Mark about a collaboration. And as he said, his day of celebration is the same as Bob Marley's birthday. So what we've been talking about is actually a songwriter's camp. And we have already gone into some of the details of how we'd want it to be set up. Us going there... Well, well, by us, I don't actually mean me. I mean... <laughs> the songwriters. The songwriters. <laughs> and the performers. Um, them coming here, having an exchange like that. And uh, hopefully, if we have that type of collaboration with the Marley family, that maybe some of those songs and performances can happen. <laughs> just say in the Marley family. <laughs> we it went could there. happen. It could happen. It could happen. It could happen. See? Sistrins. <laughs> Sistrins, you yeah, know I mean, yourself. Those... The, 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 that something like that's just really important. It, it, it strengthens the ties between our two cities. Um, um, it strengthens those ties between the um, between the musicians. But um, you know, it, it's we're all speaking a common language. That's the, that's the great thing about music, you know. And and it gives us an opportunity to to you know to build something new and interesting and exciting that um, you know is is beyond. That the people can relate to, you know, the public can relate to it, you know, and and, and that's it's vital. I just think it's vitally important, and it's the benefit of this Creative Cities network that we're in. Um, thanks, Mark. Before you, before um, I, I shift from you, though, twenty twenty one is the International Year of Creative Economy mm -hmm. for Sustainable Development. Yes. Um, is there any acknowledgement of that in Auckland? Are you doing anything in particular to to really observe this? <laughs> No, um, so 
well, there was again it's you know the, the, the knock-on effect of COVID so we were planning a, um, a creative cities conference here um, but we've had to move that back to at least next year now um, and we've still got the option of moving it even further than that so um, yeah, yeah. yeah sadly that that's that's where we're sitting with it um, we haven't toyed around with the idea of doing a virtual conference um, no, we don't want any. Let's wait. <laughs> we no, wait. No, and I, and, you know, this is the thing um, talking to Daniel about the, the, the songwriting collaboration as well. It's, you know, it's the feasible candle. to do these things online, but it's different. I, I just think that the, the, the inspiration and, the, and the, the sort of magic happens when you get people in a room together. But those conversations and those sort of late night jams and, um, you know, a few drinks under the belt as well, you know, that... that Things things start happening then, you know, um, and they, those can't be replicated over a over a Zoom call. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for sharing, um, Mark. David, anything for for the year to to mark that from KCC? Listen, me use the KCC. Forgive me. It's K S A K M C M C K S A M C. That's a lot. <laughs> Is where David gone? I'm right here. I'm right here. <laughs> So, um, yeah, there, there's a lot of um, collaborative work that we can do. Um, <clears throat> I've heard um, Dana extending um, an invitation to go to New Zealand. So when the songwriters, <laughs> when the songwriters are going over, I'll um, brush up on my skills and I could accompany them. And not for you. It's not quite for you, David, but okay. <laughs> Not for you at all. I've written, I've written quite a few songs. Ah, uh, where are they? Okay. <laughs> where are they, David? We don't have proof of this. Oh, but, but it's important that David has said that, though, Dania, because one of the things we hear complaints from, and we know it has made the news, um, one of my artists them did kind of benefit from creative cities, from entertainment industries. We did go, and we had a fabulous show, and it was wonderful. And the exchange itself, the experience was good. And... But it made the news. It made the news in a very negative way that some people are getting the benefits of while others aren't. Mm -hmm. And we know in reality it's not possible for everybody to. But what are we doing to ensure some amount of equity and that everybody has access to the information and the same opportunity? Well, some of the programs within the cities are specific. So, for example, I remember the exchange that happened with Hamamatsu in Japan. They specifically wanted a band. They specifically wanted an eclectic band. And so we sent them a number of options, some from, from Edna Manley College, some that were around, and they specifically chose the one that they wanted. So some programs are like that. That was Notice? No, that one, Notice was the one in Germany with okay. Mannheim. That one was with Nomads. So okay, cool. for some programs, they, the city specifically knows what they want based on the festival they're having or the type of engagement. And so they choose what they want. For others, it's a little bit different. We're able to send an option, but it always comes with a guideline that we're able to stick into. Now, as it relates to our city in Kingston, when we are asking for an exchange, we have the opportunity to bring to, to, to set up our own brief of what we want. And so in that, we're able to have yeah. a broader spectrum in which we can have more persons feel as if it is equitable. But it's not like we're running around choosing the same set of people to do these things. No, and it's open. And I really think we, ha we have, as an industry, we have a responsibility to find the information as well. And this is it's also where the registry comes in. in. So, so, and you sign up for the entertainment registry. You... I'm pushing Jerry a membership. It's important <laughs> that you become a member of an organization. It could be Jerry, um, it JFM. could be JFM, it could be Java. Um, Java. So, so, so there are enough organizations that there's nobody in music that you shouldn't be a part of something. Um, so you're not running around, you know, like headless chicken when you need you need that kind of assistance. I wanna have my music for me. I wanna have Chronics. <laughs> okay, Chronics so we can enter in the discussion. Chronics is just about to enter <laughs> the discussion. It is seven forty-two in Jamaica. Um, we really kind of want up to eight o'clock, 
but my, my mouth dry and I'm tired and hungry. <laughs> and there's a curfew. But <laughs> and I there's really... a curfew. <laughs> so even before perhaps we can close with, with those music and just ask for some closing thoughts from David and Mark who are on Zoom, then I'll come around to you, um, Dania. No I'm sorry, I was just doing something that, you know, radio people do. So, Mark, any, any final thoughts? Um, I know you would have loved to be here sitting beside us, but you're not for the time being. Um, so before you go, we'd love for you to just give us a vibe, how you feel about Reggae Month in particular. How you feel about possibilities for partnership with Jamaica and any other partnerships you may have with other cities that you care to mention? Sorry, I, um, <laughs> you cut out there. I mean, everything froze, so I kind of missed the question. Um, was that about partnerships? Yes, and, and it's your closing thoughts. Yeah, um, so I still believe in the value of, of, of this Crow Seas Network. It's, it's been, you know, massively. Um, helpful um, to learn from other cities, uh, to collaborate with other cities, to throw ideas around that we can all, all, all use. Um, and I, th I just think it's, it's the right path. I think now um, more than ever, uh, when communities are, are fractured, um, that we need a cohesive music strategies and creative strategies in our cities to, to bring us all together and to, to, to make sure our communities don't unravel. It's, it's, it's you know, I have a city that that quite often the the councillors and mayors, successive mayors, love to talk about infrastructure. They love to talk about roads and transport and and, and sewerage and and you know all those kind of things. But ultimately, it's it's the the music and the and the creatives that in the city that 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 are the lifeblood of it and 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 make cities just so vital to live in. Um, one other thing I wanted to to mention as well was. Uh, we, we talked about the Mastering of a Music City the document. Um, there is another really great sort of a sequel document to that called um, Keys to a Master to Keys to a Music City. Um, and that um, has a lot of different variation or it, it goes into the variations of different music boards and and the way that music cities work, um, taking on board that that not one size fits all, that there, there is uh, depending on the city and the location and and um, and various other factors that it's, it sounds very much to me like Kingston and Auckland run very similar sort of um, strategies and, and policies, um, but that won't be true of, say, um, a smaller city like um, Amarante in, in Portugal um, or somewhere in Korea. Um, so that Keys to a Music City document is really, really valuable um, and worth anyone, you know, everyone should have a, have a look at it if they can, because it, it explores different models of, of Music City um, uh, administrations and, and, and uh, deployments. Thank you, Mark. Um, David? Um, I don't know if David is still yeah, with us. I'm here. Um, we, we, you have an opportunity to do everything that you possibly can during the downtime of the COVID-19 pandemic. Nobody now apply for licenses. We have no event. We no can do everything else in terms of making music-friendly spaces and, and policies. What, what do you leave us with? Well, we have been doing um, an audit of all the places of amusement across the city. And we're getting ready to have that information. Um, made public, as well as we're getting ready to have it presented um, as a part of our overall strategic development plan. So what Dania said earlier is key in that, you know, the fact that there are no events now, they are research driven, and that's what we have been doing. Also to ensure that we come out of the pandemic in a better position than we were before, as it relates to, you know, policy and licensing and fees and costs and stuff like that. So we have, um, as I think it's almost a 200 page document that we have compiled as it relates to the broader strategic development plan. And clearly under it, um, you know, there is a significant portion um, dedicated to, you know, the city, uh, marketing the city as a creative city of music. So we have been building that out. Um, it's almost ready for submission to our minister. And from then we'll present it to, of course, our other partners, including the Ministry of Culture, Gender, Entertainment and Sports. Um, separate and apart from that, we've been doing work with um, the Kingston Creative Group, 
We've been doing work with a lot of local talents also, several projects that we're working on. We've also been doing some partnerships with companies, you know, to train our creatives in videography um, and other um, areas of the creative industry. So we have been doing um, separate things um, in this downtime um, of the pandemic to ensure that we bounce back and we're able to recover um, in a much stronger position than we were um, pre-COVID. Okay, thank you. Um, my friend on set, what do you, what, how do we move forward with, with plans for this second leg of our Creative Cities status? The focus is research, collaboration and implementation. So that is exactly how we're working it. So we're doing all the research now. As a matter of fact, many of our sister cities have actually called upon us for some of our best practices because um, internationally, Jamaica looks good. Allowed. We're yes. loud. We're still doing things. Festivals are still happening here, albeit virtually. Um, and they think that one of the comments that we got from a uh, sister city in Hanover is that for most of the cities that they spoke to, and this was about August, September, everybody felt so grim about the process. And when they spoke to Jamaica, even though we were facing the same things, and you just mentioned that we have a curfew, we have to go pretty soon, but we sounded like we had so much hope. And that is the premise on which our music is built built on all the six genres and that is the premise on which we go forward to implement so research collaboration implementation i hope we collaborate with our sister island trinidad and tobago yes. who recently got their congrats Port trinidad and tobago port of spain is now a creative city of music um it's it's been good it's been great if i may say so myself <laughs> i've had great company thanks mark and david Thank you, Dania. I just want to share um, Reggae Month, Reggae Open University, because we're speaking of university that tomorrow, the Institute of Caribbean Studies and Reggae Studies Unit at the UWI does their yearly Bob Marley lecture at 6 o'clock. You can tune in on the ICS YouTube platform for that. Um, on Sunday, we honor a woman in reggae, yes. um, Nana Queen Mother Rita Marley. Um, you know it is, um, uh, and we, 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 we invite you to tune in to that to 5.30, I think, I don't remember the Zoom link, but you can go Sosa Crew, S-O-S-A-C-R-U on Facebook. And of course, next week, we are back here, right here in this space for another Reggae Open University. No, before that, we have Reggae University on Tuesday mm -hmm. at 6 o'clock as well. Mm -hmm. I don't really remember what I'm going to talk about Tuesday. They're going to be talking about incentives. Oh, they were talking about incentives. <laughs> Lenny, you should be proud of me. Minister, you should be proud of me. And Dania, we remember. And so, Tuesday we go back to that. And then on Thursday, we have another Reggae Open University. This time we look at the impact of Reggae globally. And yeah, enough of Uno out there, so we talk about it all the time. I feel we can brag about it all the time. <laughs> that conversation will be led by Dr. Sonia Stanley Nair, um, who will be the moderator. And we also have Ibu Cooper, Copeland Forbes. We have Lily Claire Bellamy from Jaipur, who kind of look on the protection of the music internationally. Mm -hmm. And we get another sister in for balance out the, <laughs> the alpha energy um, to join, join her. We can't tell you yet, but it will be an artist. So I want to give thanks to our sponsors, especially the Ministry of Culture, Gender, Entertainment and Sport, the Ministry of Tourism, the Chase Fund, Sajikor, big up yourself, big up yourself, Starlight Productions, Jamaica Tourist Board, Tourism Enhancement Fund, CPTC, Java, JCDC, Reggaeville, Rhythm Agency, Surfer Reggae, Reggae Festival Guide, M1 Production, and SR Rehearsal Studios. I'm your host with the mostess, Colleen Douglas. That sound carny, but I'm Colleen Douglas. It rhymes, <laughs> but it rhymes. And it has been my pleasure sharing with you. And yes, we like music. We don't know what kind of music they have up there for you, but we can out with some music. We have Chronics. Smile Jamaica is quite appropriate. Yes, it is. So enjoy, and we'll see you next week.